Welcome everybody. I'm Jessica Davis, Marketing and Communications Manager for Fear Free. Thank you for joining us for part two of the Puppy Socialization Series sponsored by SIVA. In this webinar, Dr. Elizabeth Feltis, ACVB resident in private practice, and Amanda Ike, veterinary technician specialist in behavior, will cover what to do about puppies who are identified as lemons as covered in part one. They will cover options from pheromones to supplements to medications used to get these little lemons back on track, keep them in their homes, and improve the lives of everyone involved. If you have any questions during the webinar, please be sure to enter them in the Q&A box. We will have a brief Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We're very excited to have Dr. Feltis and Amanda speak with us today. So on that note, ladies, take it away. Good evening. Thank you all for coming back. We appreciate that. We're excited to be here. All right, so tonight our topic is making uh, lemonade and providing it to our puppies who are atypical and need a little bit of extra help. So tonight we're going to be talking about a couple different cases as a way to kind of review how we handle things at the clinic. So we're going to talk about a couple puppies and we're actually going to walk you through kind of what we do to help these guys. So for instance, uh, your veterinary nurse um, comes to you and lets you know that Micah who's a 10 week old male mixed breed puppy that's in the socialization class is having some issues. What she's seeing in class is that this puppy is avoiding all the other puppies. It hides underneath the owner's chair, tucks itself in, doesn't really want to come out and interact. And he's also growling at children who are in the class with their families. When your technician or nurse talks to the client after the class, one of the things that the owners let her know is that whenever they pick him up at home, uh, he actually will bite them to the point that, you know, he's leaving some bruises. Uh, and so that's very concerning for them. Uh, and so you would need to think about that a little bit. And so one of the things you do as the doctor is you're gonna go back, you're gonna look at your medical records and you're also gonna look at the emotional record um, for MIGA. And when we look at that, one of the things we're finding is that he wouldn't eat spray cheese and he also refused peanut butter um, during his last vaccine visit. So this should get us thinking about, all you know, right, you know, what are we seeing? What are we hearing? Does this fit with what we talked about when we talk about the socialization period in the last lecture? So then another little puppy is having some problems. And so Mrs. Smith calls into the front desk and she has Cooper. Cooper's a 12 week old Yorkie. And she's reporting to your reception team that Cooper is just crying all the time when they leave him. They leave him alone in the laundry area. And also, you know, he's urinating and defecating when he's alone. They noticed the last time they left him that the door frame was chewed on. He had teeth marks in it uh, and there was some pieces of wood that were missing. And Cooper's left alone for about 45 minutes or so when he's in the laundry room. But when they've tried things like crating him, they actually get a very similar behavior in that he still urinates and defecates. He's still crying uh, and he will chew on the bars of the crate. So, quick quiz, Dr. Feltis. <laughs> What's our rule of thumb for how long puppies can go? Hmm, I think I know the answer. So you're gonna, as a rule of thumb, say one hour per age in months that the puppy is old, and I say up to eight months of age or eight hours alone. All right, good answer. <laughs> I think you went to school for this or something. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what are we going to do? So what things did we hear when we're thinking about Mike and Cooper that were concerning? So biggest thing is we're hearing persistent fearful behavior from Micah. Um, we're also hearing about an unwillingness to explore. And then when we think about Cooper, we have some soiling that's occurring in the sleeping quarters. We also have some aggression that's occurring to his owners. And you know, we have some active avoidance when we also think about Micah. He's not gonna interact with anybody when he's in class. So why is it concerning? When we go back and we think about that normal socialization period, this is when they should be open to new experiences. We also know that this is also a point where they should be able to explore and be interested in exploring on their own. 
They also shouldn't be soiling where they sleep because de developmentally, they should be attracted to other areas where there are other more interesting scents of urine and stool, not where they're sleeping. So this is something that as a team, again, knowing normal is really important because your entire team can then be aware that it's time to step in and provide lemonade. When we're talking to these clients, one of the important things we like to think about is, this is their baby. This is their new little guy that they brought home from the breeder or from the rescue. And one of the things we have to remember is a lot of these clients now are first time pet owners. Uh, and that's very true of a lot of our millennials who are coming to see us now. Um, they have lots of questions, um, but you know, they've not done this before. Um, the other thing is that clients may not be aware that the, what they're seeing is abnormal. They may just think like, oh, he's pooping and peeing in the house, and that's okay because he's still a baby. Uh, they may not know that by, you know, 8 to 12 weeks, we should be starting to get a better connection of urine and stool happening outside. So your goal is going to be to step up and be the educator for this client. You're their guide uh, on the whole puppy process and how to get them started. So we wanna avoid blaming the client. That doesn't always go well in communications. So we wanna think about the client, they're doing the best they can with the information they have. Is the information they go out there and find on the internet always the greatest? No, um, but you know, if they find fear-free homes, well, that can be super helpful. There's a lot of great information in there, but that's not always where our clients land. So we wanna say, not a problem. I'm here to help you. I'm gonna guide you. And so we're gonna get you to the information that you need. If punishment is happening, again, it's about education and you need to let them know why that that's not okay. Um, the other thing to remember is that problems that you see aren't necessarily created by the client. That's something that uh, clients will sometimes express to us, like, oh my goodness, is this my fault? Um, did I do this to my puppy? Uh, and we have to have the conversation and sometimes it's a really tough conversation about no, this is actually your puppy's not normal. They're atypical and they can come that way right out of the uterus. And so that's oftentimes a client concern and we then have to address what's life gonna be like having this puppy who has a concern and a behavior problem. And it sometimes involves going back and talking to the breeder and making sure they know what we're seeing as well because that's important to a breeder and important to a breeding program. So we want to make sure that we get the information we need to make educated next steps. And that's a thorough history. When did this problem start? When did the owner perceive it? And what have they done to try and alleviate it? Those interventions that they intervened with, have they worked? Have they not worked? It is important to know what didn't work because we're not going to try it again. Everything that has been tried is really helpful to know because the next steps are going to be built upon the foundation of the history. Where is this puppy housed? Are they in a crate? Are they left loose to fend for themselves in the house? I mean, that does happen. There are some places that are raising puppies with no boundaries, and that's really important to know when there's defecation in the home. Are they not confined enough? Are they left loose? Are they monitored when they're loose in the home so that they are able to tell us when they need to go to the bathroom by circling or sniffing? What type of diet is this puppy on? Not just that, but how are they fed? Are they free choice fed? Are they eating meals? Are they out of enrichment feeders or are they out of bowls? All of that information becomes something that we can adjust or utilize as part of our plan in enrichment activity and helping with that management and safety plan. What type of activity are they being given? We know that exercise is part of development. Yes, they need to build those muscles. They need to also expend the energy so they're not expending it in a way that we view as undesirable. Where has this puppy chosen as a location to urinate or defecate? And if there's not a consistent location, that too is valuable information. Are they urinating and defecating in the crate? Does that happen when they're only alone or when they're separated from their owner or when the owner's standing right there? Do they go to the bathroom while they're resting and sleeping? All of that is valuable information to decide what we're gonna do next. And remember, 
Adaptal junior collars were recommended to be placed in puppy packs. So is it on? Do you see that when they bring them in? And is it fit properly so that it can do its job? It's helpful in socializing or, or helping the socialization process in a typical puppy. So that's really important if they're presenting as a potentially atypical puppy to help them and get the benefit of that pheromone. You need to do your due diligence. First off, if they're presenting you with what is perceived as a potential behavior problem, we need to make sure that there isn't a medical component. How we do that in the veterinary community is with a thorough physical exam. If we're really concerned that this is going to turn into something needing more than just um, a, a glazing of advice, then we need to also work it up. If they're urinating and defecating in the house, we need to work that up with a urine, urine culture. We need to do a urinalysis. We need to do a fecal and a Giardia test. If we're concerned that we might need to add in medication or if we're worried about a puppy who's having other potential comorbidities, make sure we run some lab work. A CBC and a biochemical profile are very valid. If we don't do our due diligence, we cannot say this is for sure behavior. Behavior is a diagnosis of exclusion and that means rule out your medical components. And this is really important. Um, this is Moose, he's nine weeks old. He's a German short hair pointer, he's mine. Uh, and so as a puppy, one of the things that was happening was that I was having a lot of trouble with house training. And even as a professional, it became very frustrating and I was thinking, man, I am not a good puppy trainer. What am I doing wrong? Um, he's just not getting this house training thing. And then I started keeping a log of his urinations and where they happened and when they happened. And then we observed urinating while lying in his crate and walking and just peeing. Um, so we got him in, we found he had a urinary tract infection and he had urethritis. So when you don't feel good, um, the training doesn't work. So really following those medical rule outs becomes very important. And we do see a lot of puppies that have urinary tract infections um, and it does, it wreaks havoc with your house training. So always remember medical is just as important as behavioral. Start with the basics. We always have to start there. You can't build a house starting with the roof. So first off, we need to make sure that punishment is not happening. Everybody wants to know how to stop behavior. Instead, they need to be paying for the behavior you want. It teaches them to do what we desire rather than avoiding certain things. It is the much more expedient method in the long run. We do have a training method study that shows that punishment, both positive punishment and negative punishment, was associated with a higher risk for attention-seeking behaviors, fearful behaviors, and aggression, all of the things we do not want for our clients in our patient population. Punishment has a risk for damaging effects. And remember, they're in this sensitive period. They're very open behaviorally, neurologically, to development. And so they're going to be more sensitive to the, the effects of punishment as well. Punishment correlates with an increased risk for aggression towards the owner. And that is a great way to get relinquished to a shelter. So another reason why we avoid it. And bottom line is my veterinary oath says do no harm. If I have these risks associated with that intervention, I'm going to look for an intervention that has less risk. I don't want to damage that human animal bond and a great resource for your practice would be the ABSAB punishment statement. So when we think about these little guys again, reviewing. As a veterinary nurse, this is part of my history collection. I want to make sure I'm talking to the client about housing. I'm talking to them about the activities that they're doing with their puppy. Also asking about enrichment. And enrichment comes in a lot of different ways. It can be social, so interacting with other puppies, interacting with novel people. It can also be physical, so going for a walk, playing in the backyard. Mental, you know, are we learning new things? Are we going to a training class? And then environmental, the environment is an amazing place to get out and burn some calories sniffing or interacting with, you know, leaves blowing in the wind and weird branches on the ground. It's a whole experience for these little guys and it's really important to think about everything that they're doing as a, a way of enriching their lives. 
Nutrition is also important. And that's one thing I always say is as a, a veterinary behavior technician, I do more KCAL studies now than I used to when I was in general practice. You know, what are they feeding? How much are they feeding? Is it appropriate um, for the size of the puppy and, and their growth and development? Because if we're having, for instance, a house training issue where we have some fecal soiling, I wanna make sure we're not putting in more than what the puppy can actually use. Basic veterinary care, again, I'm gonna recheck. I'm gonna look at their medical record. Are they up on their exams, their vaccines, heartworm medication, you know, flea and tick prevention? Is all of this happening as it should be in this developmental period for the puppy? This is all our basic history that we need to gather. The other thing we want to think about as we're starting to troubleshoot some of these problems that puppies have is safety, management, and prevention. When we start talking about medications, you're going to hear Dr. Feltes talk about the amount of time it takes for medications to kick in, which can be, you know, four to six weeks. And so when I have a puppy who's having a problem now, I need to come up with options for managing that environment today. Something the client can put in place and get going immediately when they get home. So these are going to be things like baby gates. You know, if they're not using a crate, we can introduce a crate. Uh, we can use drag lines. So you can see in this picture, we've got a couple different things happening. This little puppy is wearing a drag line. Um, you can see he's also kind of looking over there at the cat lounging on the floor. And so having the gate up to prevent access between the cat and the puppy prevents the puppy from chasing the cat. The drag line is on as an additional means of management in case the cat jumps over the gate <laughs> or we have you know, management failure and we still have a way to kind of catch the puppy and redirect her into doing something more appropriate than chasing the cat. Muzzle training is something that a lot of people are starting to introduce into their puppy socialization programs uh, and it's something that when we do see some aggression in some younger puppies we will actually talk about muzzle training um, to help them have a safety helmet, essentially. Uh, the goal is that most of the time you're out there, you never need it, but when you do need it, you have one they love. And so introducing it at this early stage can actually be very beneficial for life. Uh, other means of prevention, preventing uh, problem behavior are going to be things like opaque window treatments. These are found on Amazon and all over at Home Depot, Lowe's, different stores. Uh, it's static based, so it's kind of a plasticky film. You peel it off and there's, you can actually feel the static charge and you just apply that uh, to the window. So when you have a dog who is barking at the mailman or at other dogs as he's walking by the house every day, we can prevent practicing that undesired behavior by eliminating access. Uh, for a little puppy like Cooper who's having some issues being alone, we can be talking about that client or talking to the client, not about them, <laughs> uh, and come up with ways to say, okay, if we have to leave him alone, what are we going to do? Um, we're going to add in food. We're going to add in video. We're going to have something. Um, we're going to create him a safe room that's comfortable for him to be separate and be safe and okay. And we're going to avoid stimuli as much as we can. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in our patient slides. So a one-week test run, I think, is a lovely way of thinking about interventions in the socialization period. The first week, the first test run week when you're presented with a problem, easy changes to start with are removing any punish punishment that is occurring. If they're having problems with that crate, change it up. Insert, ensure that prevention is actually happening. We've recommended gates maybe initially. Are they actually having those installed? Are they utilizing them? Are they closing them? That's all things that are actual medicine here. If they're not using prevention, we can help them accomplish it and reduce the practice of the problem behavior. If we need to alter diet to help with stool consistency or to address other problems, this is the time, this first week of intervention. Add in your enrichment, add in your activity, adjust the activity, and ensure that Adaptal Junior Collar that you dispensed earlier is fit in actual use. What we need to do is set up an a, a discrete time that both you and the client can 
agree upon, let's say, that we're going to inspect the expectations that we've just provided. That's where one week comes in. If we say, we're going to do these things, I'm going to give you seven days, and I want to know how it's going. I want to see where we're at, and I'd like to see you again. If no improvement is occurring, we're going to go up to our next level of intervention. One week is lovely when you're looking at having 14 weeks to do something. So how does this work? So for instance, when we're talking about Micah, initially he's 10 weeks old and we're getting this information during his public socialization class. So again, he's avoiding puppies, he's hiding, he's growling at kids, and he's biting when his owners try to pick him up. So one of our interventions is going to be that we're going to stop picking Micah up. We're going to use avoidance and management. So we're just going to avoid it. If there's an emergency where we need to pick up Micah, we're going to feed a treat or something amazing while we scoop him up and lift him. So that, that way, if we have to pick him up, we're going to pair it with something really, really good. And again, we've got our Adaptal Junior collar on to start, so we're going to make sure that's fit properly and see what happens in one week if we just make some adjustments. Cooper, again, we've got vocalizations, urination and defecation. He's chewing the door frame. And this is happening when he's alone for you know about 45 minutes or more. So we want to add in some videotaping. And most of our clients have some sort of tool where they can actually get video of what their pet looks like alone. This can be old cell phones, iPads, um, computers, video cameras. There's lots of stuff out there. So we're going to get some videotape so we know what does Cooper's baseline look like when he is alone. And if we can, because we know he's going to have some problems at 45 minutes, we're going to not go any longer than 30. So I might run out, take the garbage out, and come back in. I'm not going to go also go run to Starbucks and grab a coffee. Uh, and then we're going to make sure we give some food as well. And we're going to use a food smeared bowl, and we can try a Kong, and we're going to say, okay, what can he eat? Um, what is he able to do when he is alone? And when we think about food smeared bowls, what I want you to envision is that you've got a plate and you have a spatula and you dunk the spatula into some icing and then you take the icing and you smear it on the plate. So it's something that's easy. The animal just has to lick it. They don't have to pin it down and hold it like they do a Kong. And it can sometimes give us a little bit more um, for these patients to work on that's easy. And this little guy, Cooper, didn't have an adaptal junior collar, so we're going to go ahead and fit one and send him home with one when we do this initial conversation. But we need to look ahead because that's your one week intervention. So let's get ready for our next week of intervention if these don't work or don't work enough. So if you see a response to the adaptal junior collar, don't forget there's other modalities to layer on additional pheromone products. You can add in some sprays, you can add a diffuser into the environment, particularly let's say if um, Micah was responsive to it and he's having issues at home with his owners. That would be a great way to add in another layer. We had that positive study that we discussed at our last um, talk and that one showed that the socialization period for typical puppies was enhanced. So we need to make sure that for those that are atypical, we have them also covered and receiving the benefit of the pheromone products. If we need more intervention, there are some other great products that we can layer in. And I'm going to talk to you at this stage about supplementation, not necessarily medication. So if we're looking for a supplement to add in, zilkine is alpha-cazozapine. It's a hydrolyzed milk protein. It comes in a capsule. And that particular product interacts at the GABA-A receptors similar to what diazepam does. So it gives great anxiolysis and it can be used in a short-term or a long-term method of use. It is a once-a-day product, which makes it very easy to administer. You can give it in the capsule. You can open it up and mix it into something. I find it quite palatable for my patients. Um, and I do feel like this is a quick acting type of supplement. So I tend to see effect within that first couple of days up to the first week. Sure, I can see more effect as I go on, but when I'm looking at one week intervention, I really do feel I see something very early in that week. 
One of my things that I'd like to take note of is that I, it, it does have a glucose sucrose content within that as a filler. And so if you're worried about glucose in a particular patient, not typically in this age group, but if you are worried in relation to, um, to that, you need to keep that in mind. This product does have that as its filler. Now, another product that I like to utilize in my juvenile patients is Anxetane. It is an amino acid that's been extracted from green tea leaves, and through that patented process, it's called suntheanine. It is a flavored tablet, and again, I do find my patients um, perceive it as very palatable. It is given twice a day as the tablet form. Currently, the larger tablet size is on back order. We're hoping that it comes back this summer, keeping my fingers crossed because I do enjoy this product. Again, I tend to see this one as being later in that week of intervention, not earlier on. So it's something just to be aware of when you're layering these supplementations in. Um, and I feel like what we tend to get out of this product is similar in that you have some GABA help and you get some inhibition, you get anxiolysis, and it, I do, again, find it very useful. Another newer product here in 2019 is Purina Calming Care Probiotic Supplement. It has a very specific bacterium, BL999, that has been shown to be very beneficial behaviorally. Please remember that there are much more serotonergic neurons in your GI tract than are in your brain, and it has a lovely system of interaction. And this particular probiotic is acting on the behavioral health of the patient. So it is supplemented through the diet. It unfortunately can take up to six weeks. I will tell you that I have had some patients see effect within the first two weeks. So this product is in it for the long haul. <laughs> it's not something that I'm gonna say, hey, how is your probiotic gonna be doing in one week? This is something where when I see a more significant patient, I'm gonna add it in, particularly if they're trying to, in a juvenile, not necessarily go to medication early on because it takes a little bit longer, but it comes in a little sachet, it's utilized once a day, and it does, it is, uh, is perceived as also very palatable. So now we're gonna look at Micah, who's another week older, and Cooper, who's also another week closer towards aging out of his socialization window. And so Micah, after our one week test, he's still avoiding puppies. Um, the hiding is resolved though, so he is coming out from underneath the chair into puppy social. Uh, there's less growling at the kids, but it is still there. And the owners are just completely avoiding picking him up, so they're not getting bit. They're also not picking him up. So we know we need a little bit more help here, so this is gonna be a case where we're gonna add an Anxetane twice daily. And he was responsive to the pheromone, so we're gonna add in an adaptal diffuser. There's no cap on that product, so if they're responsive, we can add in more. So for Cooper, he's still vocalizing, we still have urination and defecation, um, and again, we're seeing some change now on our video monitoring in that this is actually occurring even 15 to 30 minutes um, into a departure, so actually a shorter amount of time than what the owner originally thought. Um, he also, again, is not eating. We're leaving him amazing food, so cream cheese, spray cheese. They threw a steak in the blender and smeared that on a plate, and he still couldn't do steak. So he's really uncomfortable. So part of our therapy is we're going to continue to monitor. We're going to try and offer food um, if there is an unavoidable departure where we have to leave him alone. But we're also going to manage by avoiding departure. So if he can stay with a neighbor, a family member, um, if he can go with them on their trips outside of the house, we're going we're to take him with them. We're also going to continue our adaptal junior collar. And we're going to add in some Zilkine once a day and then period of calming care. So we're gonna add in something we're gonna see help within a week and something that's gonna take a little bit longer because he needs as much as he can get right now. So again, I think many of us might be starting to think about medication and maybe we were thinking about medication before, but one of the things I want to bring up is that these are fuzzy puppies, tiny babies in their homes and not every client is going to be receptive to the medication talk. Did those clients receive medication talks prior to where they're being presented in the slide? Potentially. Um, and that's really, again, if they're refusing it, that's where we're gonna start throwing in those supplementations. But for medication, yes. Let's make sure 
that we rule out medical problems outside of the brain so that we have the option to medicate. A CBC, a biochemical profile, your analysis. Why do I want that now? One, yeah, I wanna make sure that they don't have another problem I'm missing, but I wanna get baseline blood work. I always check blood work about two months after starting medication. I wanna know how the body is reacting to that medication. And that's one of the ways I can take a snapshot. So please remember though, that we've seen a case with aggression in the socialization period that is persistent. And I, for one, believe that's a crime against nature um, because these puppies are not designed to do that. Yes, can they growl at something? That's possible. But persistence in that behavior to me says that I really need to be thinking of this as an outlier and I need to be looking at what is my best lemonade that I can provide. And sometimes when I'm looking at a crime against nature, medic medication is going to pop to the forefront. And so those conversations can be tough and having them is really, really important because we don't want to pass go on an aggression case. Um, we really want to look at what's my biggest intervention I can do to minimize the practice of that problem. Another thing is profound fear and hiding. That's a welfare concern if we have an extremely fearful and panicked puppy. Medication is a benefit and a blessing for those individuals. And so that too is something else where I view, I'm on that, that board going, don't pass go. I need to make sure that I provide this benefit. And if that's not part of your practice, there is nothing wrong with it, but that is why there's a, a college and look for an ACVB boarded veterinary behaviorist or a resident, we are here to help. Um, we can consult with you over the phone. We can see your patient. We'd love to work with you. And a referral is a process and an option for these individuals. So I want to make sure that um, we all keep that in mind when medication starts to become um, something that's important. Please also realize that um, through some of our fear-free companies and our sponsors, there are options. So I know um, in our diplomat college, Dr. Times at SIVA, for example, is always available out there and willing to take questions, um, particularly in those cases where we've utilized um, pheromone products and she's potentially there to help you. So um, work your network and find who's out there to help you. We all want to see everyone succeed. So you've said, I'm going to treat this puppy. <laughs> what do we do? We get comfortable with a few daily medications. And I get this question a lot from my referring clinicians. They wanna know what should I have on stock? And really I say, you should have on stock what you're comfortable with. And comfort means that you know what you're using, you know what it interacts with, you know how it works, and you feel very comfortable in what to expect from its use within a patient. So for what we're talking about today in a juvenile patient, we have some products that are actually FDA approved. Yes, they're FDA approved for canine separation anxiety with behavior modification, because no drug should be labeled without that. Um, but you know, they are approved for canine species. So I think that's really important when we're talking about puppies. Um, the first would be Reconcile, which is fluoxetine. It's an SSRI. It increases serotonin at the neural synapse, and it does so by blocking its reuptake. So you don't tend to take it away. It hangs out there, it does a better job, and that doesn't happen overnight. This takes time. Neurochemistry shouldn't be in an instant. Um, that's where you get side effects. So six weeks to full effect. Um, and remember, cytochrome P450 competitive inhibitors are, are something that there's going to be an interaction or a potential interaction with and something we at least need to know when we're utilizing something that there could be some um, wonky absorption going on and, and effect. Um, tricyclic antidepressant that I'm referencing would be Clomacom. Um, that's clomipramine, and clomipramine is the most serotonin selective of the tricyclic antidepressants. It not only blocks the reuptake of serotonin, but it also does so with norepinephrine, so you get a little bit more help there um, in a different way. And another thing to think about is it can take four weeks to affect, and that can be really beautiful when you only have 14 weeks that you're working within. 
Um, things I think about with clomipramine, if they have glaucoma, if they have cardiac disease, um, conduction disturbances, those types of things are going to be something that gets my attention and makes me avoid this drug class. But um, in general, it can be a nice one, particularly those young puppies that we're trying to get quicker effect with. Um, any daily medication that's something for the brain. You start low, you do not start high, but you do increase. So we titrate up to effect, side effect, um, or maximum dosing and say this isn't working. That's how I, that's my tree in my head that I work my way through for each patient. I increase about every two weeks. Um, and then at times I will sit for four weeks and make a decision if I'm getting somewhere, but I'm not quite sure that I need to go up again. When I need to take these out of the system, because we have some stable behavior and we want to see if they're doing anything, I'm going to decrease every 20, by 25% every two weeks and monitor for regression. I'm also going to take it away cautiously when it's not doing something and I want to change to something else. I'm not going to cold turkey it because I want to spay the dog. That's not what these drugs are meant to do. The, if they are receiving benefit from it and they are on it, then we want to have the kindness to take it away slowly or to leave it alone and make it part of our plan when we're going in under sedation or surgery and be able to have them have the benefit of the psychotropic that's giving them an advantage in the state that they're in. But what else? Those take four to six weeks. What else do I need? I need to help this puppy in a week. I mean, that seems crazy, right? <laughs> but I'm gonna do my best. And by doing that, I'm gonna look at as needed quick acting medications. A seri is one of those that I like to keep in my pocket for these particular patients, trazodone. Um, so basically it does a blockade of select serotonin receptors. And it also has a weak reuptake inhibition of serotonin, dopamine, and some norepinephrine. It's an anxiolytic antidepressant. What does that really mean? It means that I can get some help in 90 minutes and it can last me eight hours. So it's something that I'm going to try for those patients that need an eight hour burn. Um, and if I'm looking at a patient who has a panic disorder, I'm probably gonna instead reach for a benzodiazepine. Something like alprazolam, lorazepam, diazepam, those that have an action on the GABA neurotransmitter because that's really where I'm reaching for, for my panic disorders, for my patients that are really panicked about a situation such as being alone. This drug class can cause paradoxical excitation. Why is that really, really important to know? Well, I've had two conversations this morning with some um, referring veterinarians that I have to say, Remember, this we're talking about a patient who's having an issue in a crate who's already panicked. If I give this drug and walk away, what if they're paradoxical and then they break their teeth off? That's a problem. I need to know what they're going to do on any as needed medication while I'm observing them. And if I can't do it directly, which I never can do, um, I'm going to have my client do it. So it's a vet directed trial where the client watches to see when does it kick in? So what's your onset time? 30 minutes, 45, 60, 90, let me know. How long does it stay in effect? How long do they act different? And what type of side effects are we concerned about? Because if these side effects are not gonna be conducive to being alone, then I'm not gonna use it when alone and I'm gonna find a different drug class. So anytime I'm using a quick acting, those are how I do my trials. I wanna know when does it kick in, how long does it last, and what does it look like? So again, we're going to check in with Micah and Cooper. So Mike has gotten a little bit older, as has Cooper. And so after we added in the previous step of therapy, what we're seeing is that we're having less avoidance of the puppies in class, but we're actually getting a little bit of backslide here in that we're getting more growling uh, at the kids who are present. And now the owners were really avoiding picking him up, uh, but they noticed recently that they're getting bitten now if they just reach in Micah's direction. And so that tells us, again, we have some persistent aggression and we're gonna to need to ramp up our treatment program. So in addition to our Anxetane and Adaptyl, we're gonna start some Reconcile. Uh, and we're gonna start that once a day and we're gonna be checking in with the owners to see uh, how that puppy is doing again within another week to make sure we're not getting any side effects. When we call Cooper's family, 
Uh, we see that, again, we still have some problematic behavior with vocalization, urination, and defecation, um, and he's still not comfortable being alone. But they did notice, when looking at the video, that he started to eat part of a smear bowl when he was alone. Um, so this is telling us something about maybe the Zilkeen is helping us because um, he wouldn't eat prior to the Zilkeen. So now we're going to keep videotaping to get that data and we're going to continue the Zilkeen. And again, this is going to be another patient we're going to add and reconcile, but we're also going to start a benzodiazepine and do some trials to find out uh, what dose and what duration uh, we can get. So maybe they can actually go out to dinner again. Behavior therapy is something we mentioned in conjunction with the use of medications. And behavior therapy has a lot of different ways to think about it. I like to think about it as prescribed intervention. And prescribed intervention can come in a lot of different ways. Uh, for example, if we are prescribing to leave a smear bowl and use Kongs, or to change up how we're feeding and use uh, you know, more enrichment type toys that they have to roll around on the floor to get the food out of, you know, that can be thought of as a prescribed intervention, you know, using adaptive products, um, body harnesses, leashes, head collars, thunder shirts, avoiding punishment, um, balancing the activity. And I bring all of these things up because these all should be recorded as recommendations made as part of the intervention in the medical record. So that way, again, it's trackable. We sent home a thunder shirt. Are they getting any benefit from that or not? Are they actually using it? Did he eat it? <laughs> we want to find that out. Um, and then also victory visits. If we're having any aggression towards the veterinary team, that's where we want to have them come in, have a good time, get some treats, and start making the veterinary clinic a very positive place. When we start working on things like, all right, I need him to feel more comfortable being alone, we need to work on reaching and touching, these actually should become scheduled nurse appointments. This is more than a victory visit because we're going to actually implement training and we're going to implement therapy such as desensitization and classical counter conditioning. So this is going to be more specific BMOD. And again, this is happening through a conversation between the nurse and the doctor about what therapies and what techniques are going to be best to assist that patient in making forward progress. We're going to be using positive training techniques. So we're using clicker training. We're going to be using both food and non-food reinforcers because sometimes pets just really want to chase a toy. And that's okay. I can use that. Um, if, I'm, if I'm a good trainer and I know how to use non-food reinforcers, there's a lot of ways to do it. Um, it's a specific skill set, so it is important to get out there and get some education and training. Uh, specific situations, specific individuals are going to have different needs. Um, so somebody might eat a TV biscuit on the scale, um, but when you go to reach for them, they need cheese. You have to pay them higher. We're going to also start working on cued behaviors as part of our behavioral therapy because I need to have behaviors I can use to interrupt unwanted behavior and redirect the patient to. So I think about it as creating good muscle memory so that if this puppy gets up and looks at the cat, I can say, Alice, and she stops and looks at me. Um, and then I can say, sit, and then she parks her bottom um, rather than going after the cat, and it gives the cat a chance to escape. You know, mat work is really important. Targeting, so being comfortable touching things. So if I have a patient who's nervous about hands or veterinary tools, having them learn how to target can be a very reinforcing behavior. They can generalize to a lot of different objects, and it can be a lot of fun for both the owner and the patient. We have to set expectations before we start interventions. And that's really important when we're using medication, but please recognize I mean that for every intervention that we use. So when we're looking specifically at medications, what does this medication do? When does it do it? And what side effects do you want them to watch for? Please caution them. They could get better. Yay, that's what we want. But they may not. If they don't, what would our next step be? If you don't set the expectation now, they haven't heard it the first time. You don't want to be the, the action point being the first time they've heard it if you say it at the next appointment. So what does a referral look like in your practice? Because again, it's okay to be uncomfortable medicating puppies. Unfortunately, some of us get very good at this because there are a large number of these patients that need that intervention at a young age. And 
we're here to help. So again, make sure your client knows what to expect, when to expect it, what to watch for, and what to do if this doesn't work right out of the gate. We're gonna structure some follow-up, set timelines. And we wanna make sure that everybody on the team knows what those timelines are and what those answers are when clients ask the questions. So you're gonna do some education for your team about when do I see the veterinarian again? You know, we wanna see these puppies again you know, in two weeks at least, if not sooner, because we're working with a tight timeline within the socialization period. And even if we get out of the socialization period, they're still developing, growing, and learning. So it's really important to have a lot of constant touch points uh, to make sure we actually see forward progress. If a client asks, well, when should I see help from this medication or the pheromone or the product that you sent home, the Thunder shirt? You know, we should be able to give them some guidelines and every team member should answer the same. So if we're talking about Anxetane, oh yeah, it should be, you know, two to three weeks. Zilking, three to five days up to a week. Um, they should have all of the same answers. So no matter who your client talks to, they get the same information. Because remember, they have to hear it 10 times before it really sinks in. So the better we do, the better our client's gonna do. How frequently do we need to come in for nurse appointments? When we see these little guys, we like to see them every one to two weeks. We may be seeing them every week in a puppy class or a puppy social class um, where they're getting some special assistance in addition to also seeing them in some nurse appointments here at the clinic. Because again, limited amount of time. Development is occurring whether we want it to or not. So we need to go ahead and not lose this time, but try and stay ahead of it. Build that referral network for your behavioral wellness. How do we do that? Who do we look for? So you could go to dacvb.org and that's where you're gonna find your boarded veterinary behaviorists and their residents. There might be somebody in your area that's a veterinarian with a practice limited to behavior who is not yet pursuing a residency. Um, that would be another source. Um, there's going to be some local veterinary technician specialists, hopefully, that mm -hmm. there's, there's not there's enough. Not we need enough more. Yet, so, so contact <laughs> me. We're recruiting. In your area. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And you're going to look for those guys. We just redid our website. Um, so if you go to avbt.net, there is now a search for a veterinary technician specialist. So you can put in your location and it will spit out who is close to you, which is kind of fun. You can do a very similar thing on the Karen Pryor Academy Certified Training Partner um, page, IAABC, CPDT, you know, uh, and I believe Fear Free also has a search component as well where you can type in addresses if clients are not sure who's Fear Free. Um, there's a way for them to, to find people. Um, so they can go to the Fear Free website, put in an address, and see who's in their area. Uh, and hopefully that's a good way that they find you. So our take home, watch these babies. Watch them, watch them, watch them. Because um, they're developing fast and they're developing quickly. We also want to listen to our clients and, and really hear what they're saying when they're talking about problems they may be having at home. Be proactive. Remember that those pheromones should be in your puppy packs but that's not good enough. If it stays in the puppy pack, it doesn't help you, it doesn't help your client, it certainly doesn't help your patient. So you need to inspect the expectation to help these puppies, make sure that they're wearing them, both typical and atypical, because it's gonna benefit their socialization um, in that period of time and the act of it. Get them into a socialization program, host one at your clinic. Now we've, you've heard two hours of us talking. <laughs> you are ready. Take the jump. Start a program. Make sure those puppy education packs have all of this wealth of information to help them succeed. And make sure that you intervene as soon as you hear your client say, or your front desk hears them say, I'm at my wit's end. And inspect every week to make sure that you can prevent those problems, utilize those supplements, if you have to go to medication, use as much as you can with uh, getting them in for appointments to be able to set them up for success and squeeze out every ounce of the lemon and turn it into lemonade during that socialization period. This is your time to do it and you can do it well. We just have to take the time to inspect what we're sending out of our doors. 
So if you have any questions for us, and I know a few people last time actually, uh, we got fan mail, which was really awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. We enjoyed that a lot. Um, and so if anybody wants to send us an email, you're welcome to. It's information at thebehaviorclinic.com. Uh, attention Amanda and Dr. Feltus, and we're, we're happy to answer your questions. I know Rachel's gonna be doing a seminar on running those puppy socialization classes on July 1st. Um, so Rachel's one of our veterinary technician specialists here in the clinic uh, who runs our puppy social classes, and she does a lot of our medical care training as well. Um, so she'll be doing that here soon, which will be fun. So I believe Jessica, you may have some questions for us. Yes, thank you guys so much. Um, our first question is, what is muzzle training? Oh, I love that <laughs> question. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so muzzle training. So typically, if you think about what happens in the veterinary setting, we have someone come in, they may be a little aggressive towards us. Um, and so for safety reasons, we may want to place a muzzle. And that might go well the first couple times, but over time, dogs can have a negative association because they can predict that, oh, I see the muzzle, they're putting the muzzle on, they must be going to draw blood or inject me or you know, do something uncomfortable. And so what we do is we actually will train pets to love wearing their muzzles. And this is done through a process of shaping and also some desensitization and, and counter conditioning where we're pairing the muzzle with a lot of really amazing food and amazing things. And I believe um, we do have some muzzle training videos and handouts on the Fear Free website. Um, so if you go to fearfree.com and you log in, you should be able to see some videos and some information on how to muzzle train and what that means, um, which is a lot of fun. If you have other questions, again, you're welcome to email us. We have videos as well. All right. Thank you. Our second question is, have you used Soliquin or had any luck with that product? Um, I do find it useful. I just have only so much slide space. So I will say that it is a product that we carry um, within our practice. And I feel like that product in particular marries a bunch of the other products in combination. Um, it can be very successful. Um, again, I feel like it would be an intervention at the step where you're looking at your product shelf and saying, I have Zilkeen, I have Anxetane, I have Soloquin, I have Purina Calming Care. Um, the supplementation process really comes down to what is, what are the products in your practice that most of the veterinarians are comfortable utilizing, good at utilizing, knowing when to expect seeing something, and knowing when to inspect it. So for me with Soliquin, I tend to see that it takes about three weeks. Um, so it would be more in par with the Anxetane product that I mentioned. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, when do you choose Zilkeen versus Anxetane? And why is Anxetane for one and Zilkeen for the other? Well, um, so for one, Zilkeen is a hydrolyzed product. So that's going to be in one of my, you know, uh, patients who can't take certain food sources, those that are food allergic, have reactions. I'm going to reach more for Zilkeen over Anxetane because Anxetane is a flavored product. Um, compliance can be an issue in some of my households. And when I mentioned twice a day products, um, I will sometimes get an interrupted and said, nope, try again, doc. Um, and so once a day product can be much more beneficial in those particular households. Um, again, I feel like Zilkeen in its fast action can be very useful when I have a client who is truly at their wits end and is not sure if they're going to throw in the towel and have the the patient go back to its breeder. So urgency can be a need and knowing when products kick in, at least in your experience, can be helpful and setting the expectations. So those are some of the, the differences. I feel like there's probably more than what I have time to talk about, but when I'm trying to give you a snapshot and a, or a if I'm pulling out the five minute um, you know, list of notes in my head, that's probably the top things that you should be thinking of. Um, for a more complete um, kind of discussion and what I would say as far as um, some of the, the studies that have been done, please email me and I can send you a list of those sources because there's more information than what I could possibly talk about right now. I probably uh, could go on all night. <laughs> all righty. And our next question is, what are your thoughts on Anxetane slash Composure for cats? 
Um, that's a good one. Um, both are pretty palatable. Um, we carry Anxetane. That tends to be the one that we reach for a lot more than we do Composure. Uh, in our practice, it was something that when we used both products, we had a lot of positive feedback about Anxetane. Um, people tended to see it kick in faster, um, and the palatability was was a big difference for, for our patients. I feel like another talking point, at least within my practice and in my referral load, um, most of my clients have experienced composure prior to coming here and either they have found it helpful or not helpful. And so I, I think that maybe the, the nature of my referral sources tends to be very pro composure. So they've already done their trials and that may just be kind of, you're talking to someone who's not at the first level of intervention. Um, I am a referral source. And so I think that that's another reason that I tend to reach for, for the Anxetane because a lot of my referral sources also do not and the patient may not have yet been exposed to it. So this may be a skewed population, a skewed answer for you as well. Yeah. Alrighty, and then our next question is, how do you keep these calming products in your clinic when clients can get them cheaper at other places like Amazon? Our clients are getting these calming products and others cheaper than what they can get them into our clinic. What are your thoughts? So, okay, I put my practice manager hat on. Um, and so I look at the value of what we can provide here in the clinic. So when our team is presenting a nutraceutical they're again presenting the value, they're presenting um, the information about the product, they're able to answer questions that Amazon can't answer. Um, also, when the client needs support, oh my goodness, he ate five or he ate the whole bag of composure, what do I do? Um, we're the place they call um, for support. And so that's something we look at. We also try and price relatively competitively um, so that, you know, one, I want to cover for our services, but you know, if I can get it here, great. Um, but honestly, having products here and being able to put them in clients' hands during the appointments does make a big difference. If I have to send them to an online store like that source or um, one of the first, that's first choice, those things, um, they're gonna have a chance to go online and search a whole bunch of other areas. But if I can say, I've got it here, would you like to go home with a month's supply? Um, would you like to go home with three months supply? What can I set you up with? they will walk out the door with the product because of the convenience purchase. It's here in the clinic. Please remember, these are puppies in their socialization period and urgency is really your product, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I'm in this appointment with this client and I say, you know, you can go get this on Amazon, but I am not sure that is in the right interest if you want to get it started today. It could be here tomorrow. It could be in here in, in, here in two days. I don't know if you have Prime, but <laughs> ultimately, I, I want this in the patient yesterday. And so most of the time in my appointments, I can send them with the first product and I'm very candid. I say, I know you can get this at other places. What I can offer is that we can start this right now. You can put this in your patient as soon as you get home. And I want to know that that's happening quickly so that we can see progress. If you choose to get it elsewhere, I understand. However, I'd really like to get this started today. So maybe we can think about using that as the second refill when we know this is working and I already have the feedback that this is working so that your patient's chart is complete and I'm helping your puppy be successful. So uh, that's my take on it is you have 14 weeks and I don't know that two days is really the smart way to go. I think you wanna take it home now. Good question though. It's, it's a challenge. That's a challenging question that I see all the time on the practice management forums. So it's, but it comes down to sell your clinic, sell your product, sell what you can do for the client um, and, and that urgency of getting at home with them today. Alrighty, and our last question is, it is really hard to tell a client that what I am seeing in their puppy at puppy socialization class is abnormal even harder to get them to a vet behaviorist as soon as possible. What is the best way to have this conversation? Ooh, that's another really, really good one. Um, and I bet Rachel will also address this um, in her questions probably on the first as well, because I see this one coming back. It is a hard conversation. And so when we're doing our puppy socials, um, one of the things that we're making sure to do is talking about normal behavior a lot. 
Um, so when puppies are playing and puppies are interacting with things, we're pointing out that normal behavior as much as we can. And that way, hopefully, we're starting to bring it to the forefront for the owner that, wait a minute, I'm not seeing these things that she is saying are normal. Um, maybe I need to talk to them after class. Um, and when we are seeing things that are abnormal, the first time, first time they come up, we may be like, okay, you know, I just wanted to let you know, I'm, I'm a little concerned about a couple things I'm seeing with Fluffy tonight. Um, I would like you to watch these at home over the next couple days. Um, here's a handout sheet if uh, you have happen, happen to have, it's a Yin's um, Body Language of Fear um, handout. I actually download that and print that out for everybody in our puppy socials because um, it goes through fear, anxiety, and stress in pictures, which is really great because owners can be watching at home and go, oh my goodness, yes, I'm seeing panting, I'm seeing pacing, I'm you know, seeing concern and br brows that are furrowed. Um, and they start picking up on it a little bit more at home and then they report back to you. Um, and then you have another conversation. Well, what did you see at home? Um, and it starts to drive that conversation about normal versus abnormal and then going, okay, well, what do we do? What do we do if it persists? So if the client doesn't buy in on the first conversation, when they come back for the next class, again, what are we seeing? Point out a lot of the normals and have a conversation about what's concerning. I also want to challenge you to say, all right, you know, I, I understand that you're not ready for that step, but I want you to hear that I am, and I, I'm concerned enough that I'd like to see you back in a week, and this is the intervention that we're going to do. You're not ready for medication. You're not ready for supplements. Well, let's refit this product. Let's use management safety and avoidance, and let's take away the punishment, and let's see where you get in a week, because I, I really want to make sure that the problems that you're reporting that you feel are distressing are starting to abate because this is this is a dog that's going to be with you i mean this chihuahua is going to live for 16 years and it's going to be your best friend but i don't want your best friend to bite you <laughs> so let's make sure that we're seeing the interventions be successful and if in a week they're not well, let's have another conversation and let's see what we're both comfortable with mm -hmm. so i understand they're really hard to get referrals but we also are here on the phone and can take your calls if you need anything that needs to be treated within your practice, if they agree to let you treat and yeah. you would like some consultation, please reach out to um, a boarded diplomat, to their resident, and we're here to help give you some guidance because we do see the ones that say yes and we have experience treating a, a multitude of these guys. So um, benefit from our experience, I'm happy to share. And we'll also pull up information, you know, if I've got a client who's like, well, you know, I just don't know. Um, that's where we're going to cite what we know about normal behavior and normal puppy development and provide them with additional, you know, handouts and, and materials to help them go, oh, wow, yeah, you're right. I didn't know that this was so important in this puppy social, this socialization window. I had no clue about this. Because um, always remember, you know, as a technician, I had zero behavior in school. Um, I had to go out and find it. Um, and a lot of our veterinary team members don't have much behavior education. So the public, when you think about the public, they have even less education. So it's not an easy sell and it's going to take time, but you have to be patient and consistent and they will come along. Um, they will come. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Feltis and Amanda. Thank you, Siva, for sponsoring us. And thank you everyone for joining the webinar tonight. Be sure to check out the last webinar in the puppy socialization series on July 1st, which will cover running a puppy socialization program in your practice. You'll be able to find the recording of this webinar on fearfreepets.com within the next week or two. Thanks again and have a great night. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.